Welcome to Real Herbalism Radio, recorded live at River Road Studios, the Herbal Nerd Society, for which we would not be able to do any of this. Right. Right? Yes. <laughs> we are thankful for the Herbal Nerd Society. When I don't want to come here some days and record because I got other things to do, I just remember there's a bunch of Herbal Nerd Society members paying me to get here. I yeah. know. <laughs> I know. And they get content every single week. We put an article mm-hmm. together with it. So I'm learning. I'm learning things. And I yeah. love sharing the things that I'm learning with other people. So above and beyond the the more advanced herbal articles for the Herb of the Month, uh, we also have access to all of the old podcasts from which we realized today we've done this for about 60 years now. So we have 180 yeah. episodes, 160 of which are in the backlog. So you have 160 episodes of podcasts that you can get a hold of if you're the practical or the Herbal Nerd Society member. And also you get an ad-free viewing experience. No mm-hmm. pop-ups, no you know right. banner ads, no... Google ads, it's just straight content. Yep, and so. the Let's Talk series where we have a, a yeah. section where people yeah. can listen to some of our guests give a, a specific information about their chosen topic. Mm-hmm. That's right. All right, on with the show. Early summer is absolute heaven for most herbalists. We get to head out into the field to start foraging, and even better, we get to garden. Today we're talking with Maria Noel Groves, author of Grow Your Own Herbal Remedies and Body into Balance and owner, herbalist at Wintergreen Botanicals about herbal gardening and choosing the best plants to start your own lung tonic herbal remedy garden. Now here are your hosts, Candace Hunter and Sue Sierra Lupe. I'm Candace Hunter. And I'm Sue Sierra Lupe. And, and welcome, welcome to Real Herbalism, Herbalism Radio. Radio. Welcome, Maria. Yeah, welcome. Thank you for having me. Yay. It's so good to have you back. For new listeners, they may not know that Maria Noel Groves ha- is a returning guest for us, and we do also have one of your wonderful articles on our site, and of course, a book review for your fabulous now two books. Awesome. Thank yes. you. Yes. 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 I'm glad to be back, and it is beautiful in Eugene right now, which yes. is nice. Yes. 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 It is the perfect time of year for us to be starting our gardens, really. Yeah. So no, Maria loves us so much that she came all the way from the East Coast just to visit us. Yes. Just to visit you guys. <laughs> right. And of course, we're laughing because you actually came here for the Free Herbalism pro- Project. Yes. Yeah. Herbalism yeah. Project. They have it on a Sunday, which is my clinic day, and, and I would like them to be better about revolving their needs around mine. So we'll work on that. But could you just talk a little bit about that project that you were re- recording? Yeah, with? I was very excited to be part of that. So Mountain Rose Herbs does this free event twice a year, and they bring in usually two herbalists to do talks that are maybe about a ha- an hour and a half long. Plus, they have a few other odds and ends, speakers, vendors, food, and it's just a beautiful event at Mountain Mount Pisgah Arboretum, which was gorgeous. We had a, just a perfect day for it and just really, really nice. And of course, everything is free. I mean, maybe not not the food and the vendors, but to attend yeah. that day, it's free. You just register and go, which is really yes. nice. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. So it was really fun. Yeah. Yeah. yeah you got yeah. to go. I got to go this year. Oh, wonderful. Really spring. Yeah. It was really fun. I, so I loved glad. both your talk and KP Kelso's yeah. talk. It was. It was great. Yeah. I mean, yeah, KP I, is always great too. I've, I've heard him he do that talk before. So it wasn't, yeah. it didn't, there, were ne- there was nothing new for me, but I really was excited to have him there because he's a great speaker. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, he is. He we, is. we appreciate how Mountain Rose brings people to us so we can interview them in person. Yes. So thanks, Mountain that. Rose. Yeah, it was <laughs> nice. I also was able to multitask and go to Powell's and do a talk for them on Saturday. So it's been a busy, but really the, the Free Herbalism Project was what got me here. And yes. then I got to take advantage of all the other opportunities that Oregon has to offer. Yeah. So we are definitely sending our gratitude and hugs to Mountain Rose Herbs. Yes. <laughs> Thank you. Likewise. So Powell's Bookstore, the the city the city block of books. Yes. Fabulous. Huge. Mm-hmm. It yeah. is, I think, supposedly the biggest independent bookstore in the world. Yeah, I wouldn't and be surprised. Enormous. Yeah. Yeah. So could you tell the listeners a little bit about what you do day to day as an herbalist? Sure. So I I do some not so exciting things as an herbalist. I spend a lot of time sitting at my computer <laughs> answering emails, but my business is kind of threefold. So I see clients and do holistic health consultations, both in my office, uh, out of my home and distance via telephone. And then I do a lot of teaching. I teach online nationally, but then I teach out of my home. And so I have live classes and those usually happen in the growing season because it's just not safe for people to come to my house in the wintertime. Right. It's right. New Hampshire. Yeah. But, uh, and I'm on a bad 
curve in the middle of the state park. But <laughs> nice. I do that and I love teaching. So classes are really kicking in right now in my advanced series. And pretty soon my, my beginner series will be starting soon as well. And then last but not least, I have the writing background. So I used to be an editor for Natural Health Magazine. I've got a, a journalism degree. And so that sort of was how I originally approached herbalism was as a journalist writing about herbal stuff. And then I left that to become an herbalist. But I still do a lot of freelancing. So I've always got deadlines that I'm working on in the, amongst answering emails and setting up classes and doing course um, programming stuff. And then I also, of course, have my two books. So Body Into Balance came out first, and I'm so excited with how well it's done. And now a lot of schools, I'm always hearing about schools across the country that are using it as a core textbook, especially in their first or second year programs, mm-hmm. which oh, that's is exciting because it's based off of my you know initial like introductory course material. So it's not that far of a leap, but I'm so excited that people are finding it useful for that. Yeah. And then the second book just released, you know, we're recording this in May, it'll air a little bit later, but it released in April. April, so about a month ago. And this one, is, Grow Your Own Herbal Remedies, is about growing plants and mm-hmm. yeah. specifically kind of like body into balance. It's organized by body system or health goals, health concerns, so that you can easily find what is going to work best for you. And all the plants in the book are really pretty easy to grow plants, easy to make remedies with, very safe mm-hmm. um, and usually very effective for yeah. a lot of different things. I just taught a class this weekend and you used your book as one of the examples that Here's because of the way it's arranged. Yeah. It's so easy and um, it makes sense the way you have things described and then mentioning to people if you want more information. She has another book which goes into more detail with more of the, the biochem version that I like, I, my yeah. personal <laughs> bias of, of teaching. So I, I appreciate having those accessible to folks. Yeah, the first yeah. book is a lot. I mean, it's easy to read through. It's very like it layperson's is. language, but it is dense with information, mm-hmm. sort of like anatomy and physiology yes. holistically, and then teaching you herbs at the same time. But then this one is a little bit lighter, more practical, hands-on, um, really, you know, they're both beautiful, but the second book just has so much more photography. Mm-hmm. And so just really lovely to just kind of flip through while you're learning about the plants. Yeah, thanks for putting so much careful time into that. It's a lot of work to put together a book. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and yours is the new, your new book is all based on the work that you've done in your garden, right? Correct. Which you have spent over a decade, I believe it is. Yes, so I've been working with herbs for a little more than two decades, but it's been a little more than one decade that I've been living at my home and had access to a garden. And I didn't come into it with a lot of gardening experience by any means. So I did kind of everything wrong at first. Uh And then they were like, oh, that's why they say not to, you know, let your weeds go to seed. Uh (laughs) But it's been a lot of work on soil and just practicing. We have a lot of um, pests around that love to eat the plants. But the good thing about herbs are that they're way easier to grow than vegetables. They're much easier to grow than even most flowers. Mm -hmm. And so I've ended up kind of not doing most produce, joining a local CSA and just devoting almost all of my garden beds to herbs. And they're usually more pest resistant and they don't need as much irrigation and they're just really yeah. nice. Plants well, to grow. The and very, I'm an herbalist, so it works out well. Yeah, yeah, perfect. The very things that that we want as herbalists are the things that they grow to defend themselves. Mm-hmm. So the terrapins, for example, would they they focus on that? They love that. So that's how they they keep either the pollinators coming in or the pests going out, and that makes them easier to grow for sure. Yes. Mm-hmm. And there's a the I mentioned how your book is put together by. Uh, the one page we're looking at here is lung tonics. Yeah, I love the fact that you've got everything like arranged. When I've started herb gardening, I, I, it was like random. Oh, look, I've heard of that 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 herb name before. I'll put that in my garden. Mm-hmm. Oh, look, and I just had all these like random plants that you know some of them had absolutely nothing to do with anything my personal family ever encounters, mm-hmm. and that was it was crazy. So you've got everything. You've got a nice selection of herbs and they're all arranged in groups. So you can kind of think about what is it that my family like deals with? Exactly. Yeah. Like in my family, 
respiratory issues. Definitely. Uh That's why we're all like, I'm like fawning over the lung heart. And I'm like, oh. Yeah. And then even if, you know, even if you wanted to do lung stuff, you could look at the descriptions of each herb and see if maybe one of them fits with, you know, if you have mucousy issues, Mm -hmm. then maybe you want to grow whorehound. But if your yard is really soggy, then maybe you wouldn't want to grow whorehound because it likes drier places. So you can look at both your growing conditions and also what, you know, each herb does and what's going on in your family to pick and choose too. Mm -hmm. So you may or may not grow all of them in the lung garden and they don't necessarily all grow in the same places in the garden but they have similar uses right yeah Yeah, Yeah. for sure yeah this has been a struggle for you candace oh yeah pollen season is challenging Um, this is the first year that i can say i have been not hiding in the house through the entire month of may and half of april Mm -hmm. to get away from the pollen so that's a good thing things are getting Mm -hmm. stronger i'm getting stronger but i do have hay fever i've had that since I was a small child. Mm -hmm. And so each year, you know, I go through the pollen season and then we get done with that and then things dry up usually around mid July in our area. And we go into drought season, which I'm always celebrating. Like, Oh, thank God. Finally I can breathe. Woohoo. And then it's fire season. Right. And so I get a few weeks like last year, I think I had two and a half, maybe three weeks of being able to enjoy outside. And then there was the fires. Yeah. Yeah. And it's really climate change. Boo on you. Yeah. And and it's it's frustrating. I mean, then everybody was hiding inside with me. So, you know, that was really sucky. Yeah. yeah, and there are in this garden that we're going to talk about. There are some herbs that are useful during fire season as yeah. well as during allergy season. And although there is, you know, this is part of kind of the immune section of the gardens, and so there is an allergy and sinus garden. There's just kind of a general immune system, so you might incorporate some of those. But this particular garden has some of my favorite herbs for. Yeah. Well, I want to stuff. talk a little bit about whorehound because that's one of the ones that I have randomly planted, and it hasn't done necessarily well. But then, you know, two years later, I'll be like, oh, look, there's Horhan. I think I'll plant that again. You know, I'll plant it like I forget that I'd done this before and I'll put it in a different spot. And then it, you know, makes it through the season, but then it doesn't really make it past that yeah. season. Horhound is a so. little finicky. In fact, I need to get a hold of some more Horhound this year to replant it because I'm definitely not in its prime area of the country so you know it grows all over the country even as a wild plant and an escaped plant but it it really prefers kind of drier sunnier spots when i lived in the southwest for herb school it we were just four miles from the mexico border and it would be growing like on the side of the road Mm -hmm. was where we would see it and my garden is certainly not that because i'm in like cold damp pocket of new hampshire so i have a spot that's kind of drier but if we get a cold really like cold, damp winter, or if we don't, this year we didn't have a lot of snow cover, so there wasn't much protection. So a lot of my mint family plants just basically got killed. I mean, mm-hmm. maybe they'll pop up from seeds, but um, yeah. so it really is kind of a finicky plant. You know, you might have a year where it comes back in the after the winter and it's growing like gangbusters. And then another year that it comes, you go and look at it and it's just all dead right. or that it self seeds really well. So it, it depends on the season, but it's pretty easy to grow besides that. And it's a potted to, plant. You could probably do it as a potted plant. Yeah. I haven't done that, but it would, especially if you had a kind of cool dry, or not a cool, but like a warm, dry spot. Right. Yeah. And then you might be able to put it in a greenhouse for the winter right. just to give it a little extra protection. Or just inside. Have you done that? Have you yeah. Done that's the nice. only time I really had any success with it. Uh, was yeah, I kept throwing year. it in my garden. I think it just got too wet. Mm. Yeah, you know, it's a really wet climate. It doesn't here. like yeah. wet spots, mm-hmm. and it doesn't yeah. like a lot of mulching or anything like that. You know, a lot of my garden gets really good soil, a little bit of moisture, right. mulching, but not. You know, this would be going near your lavender and your rosemary, and right? Those plants right. that don't that want to be growing in dry, mm-hmm. sandy soil, slightly lots ignored. of sun, yeah. slightly ignored. Yeah, <laughs> yes, yeah. We have a heat pump at my at my house and the yarrow is just loving that location nice. you know because there's all this it's just getting abused and yeah. just oh thank you very much and you know it's really dry there so i think maybe i'll try yeah. a little whorehound there yeah, yeah that'd that's be a good nice idea. yeah especially that little yeah. bit of heat might also protect it throughout the winter you don't yeah. have winters like i have winters no but, we don't um, oh, okay. ours are laughable yeah <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah they are yeah. We're like oh it's snowing this week <laughs> yeah you well, got melted no <laughs> <laughs> the end yeah yep. 
Oh, nice. So yeah, so whorehound is one of my favorites. It's funny because it's you you know grows in these dry environments, but it actually works really well for like damp, moist situations. Yeah. So it's most famous for wet mucusy coughs to help kind of expectorate and bring that up. So people usually will use it as a syrup or a cough drop for that. Although you can use it in tinctures, or you probably don't want to do a tea because it's super Horrible. bitter. It's not mm-hmm. a good taste yeah. at all. Mm-hmm. So something that you can get over quickly. And the candies are nice and all, but they're pretty weak. I mean, yeah. so that's not the way that I usually work with it. But um, but it also, besides just being useful for those wet, damp coughs and expectorating all that phlegm and mucus, it just seems to have this really nice moving, thinning action on mucus. So I found it really useful in allergy support, post-nasal drip, you know, whether you're dealing with infections or allergies, but you've got just a lot of mucus going going on anywhere kind of like from the lungs up. Oh, nice. what about as a steam? I don't know if it would work. It is interestingly an aromatic plant, even though we don't really notice aromatics mm-hmm. off of it. Like if you smell it, it doesn't yeah. seem aromatic, but it's super oily. It does have a lot of, you know, essential oils and oily yeah, compounds yeah, in oils, it. Yeah. Um, and you'll feel that like if you're pressing out the tincture, you actually feel your yeah. hands feel a little I've bit oily. rise when you're to doing the surface. That. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. So it might be useful as a steam. I haven't, I usually think of ones that are more obviously aromatic. Garo like or, mm-hmm. Garo, Bee Balm is one that I might use pretty oh, frequently. Peppermint. In fact, I have a pretty yummy lung tea that I make that is, you can use it as a steam. So I'll like inhale it as it's steeping and then sip the tea and it tastes good too. And that one has bee balm and peppermint and then some more soothing herbs like marshmallow and sometimes some plantain. And I might throw a little bit of Korean licorice mint or anise or fennel or something kind of on that sort of sweet licorice soothing side to it. And Korean licorice mint? Oh, yeah, I'm on Tell a mission. Me. Yeah, I am on a mission mm. to make Korean licorice mint better known. It's not in the lung garden, but it certainly could be. It's in like the flavor garden because that's usually why people think of it. But it's very closely related to anise hyssop. Anise hyssop is um, Agastache funiculum. Uh, funiculum being mm-hmm. also the genus name of fennel. So it's kind of named after yeah. fennel. Which grows and, well in the Oregon area, just oh, saying for is all. Is it wild yeah. here? Fennel, no. I, I know it's wild further south. For fennel? Um, yes. Oh, fennel goes crazy oh, here. But yeah. anise, liquor, uh, anise mm-hmm. hyssop. Mm-hmm. I went to a, an herb sh- show for, and they had a place where you could buy starts. And I was really tempted by it. But I yeah. thought, oh, yeah, where am I going to put that? Yeah, mm-hmm. it'll you know? probably try to take over too. Well, yes, and I mean both anisysip and Korean licorice are really, really similar. They're slight. I, I feel like there are probably a lot of variations amongst the seeds. So some of them taste a little bit more like mint and licorice, while others have more like a honey fennel flavor. And I like the ones that have more of a honey fennel flavor, which mm-hmm. usually is going to be the Korean licorice mint, which is right. opposite of what you would expect from their plant names. Right. But uh, <laughs> from both are common and their their Latin plant names. But I like the more like softer honey fennel flavors, but they look really, really similar. They're very difficult to distinguish from one to another. And uh, they're really easy to grow. And they'll they'll live for a couple of years and then they'll die off, but they self seed rampantly. But they're yes, not they do. problematic. Like you yeah. can easily pull them out, you can easily move them, and they're pretty. And they don't, you know, I don't consider them a problematic self seeder mm-hmm. by any means. Fennel is a and problem so in our area. We have the, mm-hmm. some beautiful spaces that it's escaped from the garden and um, up top Spencer's Butte, for example. Mm-hmm. It's just it's pushing out a lot of the gorgeous natives that are in that area. And, you know, pollinators love it. And I use it for even more specific things like reducing testosterone for trans patients and stuff like that. So it's fabulous, but we have to be very responsible with it. And Mm -hmm. I kind of fear with some of those invaders that it might be a little too late. So pull it up, use it. Don't, don't plant it and be irresponsible about it. Keep it under control. Mm -hmm. Yep. And then, the, of course, trying to dig up the roots. Hardy, mm-hmm. har, har. Oh, yeah. yeah. Whereas yeah. Korean licorice mint and anise hyssop just like pull up like nothing. They're not, they don't have deep roots at all. You mm-hmm. can just do it by hand and boom. And they done. have similar prop. Now, this Korean licorice mint, can you spend a little bit more time talking about yeah, that? Yeah. So um, I know Strictly Medicinal Seeds does sell the seeds. Um, and theirs are pretty yummy, but they're a little more minty tasting than the ones that I have. And unfortunately, the ones that I have came from a seed source that no longer is selling the seeds. So I'm, ah, I'm also on okay. a mission to find somebody who's selling seeds of the ones that taste like mine. Um, but it is, 
It's just really delicious. It's got this sort of honey fennel flavor, but then medicinally, you know, mostly we use it for flavor and it's beautiful purple flowers too. So it's a really pretty mm. herb in the garden. It's easy to grow, but uh, it also does have some gentle nerving properties. So it is a little bit soothing and supportive for the nervous system. It, as you might expect from something in the mint family that tastes kind of licorice fennel-y, it is soothing for the digestive system. It's nice for nausea, upset stomachs. It is also good for just kind of gently supporting digestion. So it's nowhere near as potent as say peppermint would be at like kicking things up way too mm-hmm. much, but it does gently increase digestion, gently kind of eases gas pain and bloating. It's kind of like a gentler mint combined with fennel as far mm-hmm. as its medicinal activities. And then in traditional Chinese medicine and traditional Korean medicine, from what I understand, it's often used to help clear like summer heat. So in the, and Michael Moore would often use it this way, the Agastaches this way too, where if it was really hot out and you need to kind of a refrigerant to cool that heat and inflammation, you would drink it iced. And it's just That sounds sweet. great. Yeah. That sounds really yeah. great. I'm loving that. It's a great flavoring agent for teas. And it is in, so in TCM, and Korean medicine, it's often used also to support immune system health. So kind of like many other mint family, just sort of gently immune supportive, antimicrobial, but not as potent as say something like bee balm or oregano or thyme. It's a little more gentle than that. And then on top of that, if you take the flowers or the leaves, they both taste really nice and throw them in seltzer and a little bit of vanilla extract with that, it tastes like a posh root beer. Uh, without any sweetener oh. at all. Yeah. So it's really oh. yummy to throw in or infused waters. You know, the flowers are really pretty or you can just use the leaves and they pop up pretty early in the season. So you can be making beverages with them from like pretty early in spring all uh-huh. the way into fall. They they have nice showy blooms in mid to late summer that still look pretty for like almost a whole month. Okay. Wow. That sounds so grow, great. Yeah. Grow Korean licorice mint or anise is up. They have, they're similar, but, similar. but okay. sm- if you can like smell and taste them beforehand and make sure you have one that you really like the flavor. Right. Of. Okay. Yeah. Good. Well, let's go through a couple more of these. I've got to ask you about wild cherry because we have, you know, cherry seasons coming up. Mm-hmm. It's not the same as regular cherry trees, though, right? No, um, you have two species that tend to be used medicinally. So you have your wild black cherry, um, and I don't have the Latin name in front of me, but it's like Perna serentina or something yeah. like that. And then we also have the choke cherry, which is also pretty common and usually stays more of like a smaller shrubby tree, so it's a little easier to harvest. And that's your Prunus virginiana, and but it grows across a lot of the United States. And you can use either one of those other species. Species are usually less commonly used, but both of those, the wild black cherry and the choke cherry, if you scratch and sniff them, they kind of have a little bit of like an amaretto slash um, cigar like aroma mm-hmm. to them. I like the flavor of wild black cherry a little more than the choke cherry, at least in, in my yard. But uh, you can use either one of them, whichever one you have, and you can prune them and make medicine with the bark and the twigs, or you can um, take down a whole tree because they're both pretty common trees that will grow in, you know, after an area has been disturbed, they're among the first trees to come in Mm -hmm. and then create that habitat. And then usually they'll die off there. They're very prone to diseases and pests. And we have a lot of like tent caterpillars and web worms. And usually that's what you see them on are those are the wild cherry trees Um, and choke cherry often will have black knot fungus. So usually those, especially the ones that have fungus are not the ones you want to be harvesting. So ones that are happy, shiny, younger bark um, with the little white lenticels and you can just harvest those and you can take down a whole tree if you have like a whole bunch of them because they do because they're so prone to disease if you're pruning it a lot that then becomes an area where it can become diseased Mm -hmm. so something i learned from seven song especially with these trees that are you know almost weedy in a sense that you could just choose to take down one whole tree versus pruning a bunch of trees and since it's so weedy it's usually not a problem Mm -hmm. but then i usually do dry it first and i generally harvest as kind of trained by michael moore who is trained by talking about leaf so we're using the um bark bark and twigs Mm -hmm. of you know maybe up to about one inch in diameter so while it's still pretty young and then you don't have to separate out the outer bark because we're going for that like green inner bark Mm -hmm. but if they're twigs you can just chop them up and if it's you know slightly bigger than maybe the the width of your pinky but you know smaller than about an inch diameter you can just scrape off the bark and not worry about the 
the brown outer bark, you can include that too. I usually do put a little glycerin in my tinctures because the bark does have the tannins, tannins yeah. and it, this mm-hmm. will get really gloppy usually within about a year or so. But if you add glycerin, like 10% glycerin to your tincture along with your alcohol, it'll keep for several years as opposed to just like six months to a year before it gets all gloppy and gross, Mm -hmm. but uh, really nice. And I do usually dry it and I also tend to harvest it after it flowers. So typically in the fall, but you can harvest it really anytime after it flowers. Some people do use it fresh and some people do use it earlier in the season, but it does contain some cyanide like compounds. And usually if it's dried, before you make medicine with it. And also if you're harvesting a little later in the season, Mm -hmm. then you don't, you have less of a concern of that. And for us, it's usually not a big problem anyway, because we're consuming it in small quantities and extracts and things. But if livestock browse on this, especially when it's wilting, so if like a tree blows down and then Mm -hmm. the goats come and nibble on it, it can kill livestock Mm -hmm. from Mm -hmm. those cyanide compounds. It's bird friendly. Yeah, birds can eat the yeah, berries. Yeah, um, and we can eat the berries too. Not really the seeds. The seeds no, are no, pretty that's high in that, but the, the, uh, but the berries yeah. are edible for both. They're definitely tastier on wild black cherry than they are on, on choke cherry. Choke cherry, that's the name. Yeah, but choke cherry <laughs> was used often, from what I understand, from native by Native Americans because it was very abundant and it's small. And, you know, the berries yeah. are not fifty Way feet up, up high, in yeah. the sky; yeah. they're at human level. So a lot of the pemmican bars were made with choke cherries, even though they're not quite as tasty. They kind of just have like this astringent puckery. Mm-hmm. It's not that they're terrible tasting, but they're just not. Yeah. So I have, choice. A, I have a spot that's got full sun and it gets hot and it's rather dry. I originally planted a cherry tree there. Mm-hmm. It died. Yeah. Cherries the are squirrel. prone to disease. Yeah. yeah. Well, and it, it just didn't make it past the first year. So mm-hmm. it died. But the squirrels planted a, a um, acorn. And so we have an oak tree that's now growing there. And we decided to leave that for now. There are wires, you know, uh, power lines above it. So we're going to have to cut the oak down at some point. But until it gets there, I figured, well, that'll be fine. And I was thinking about, I wonder if the choke cherry would do okay next to or near that oak tree. Because the oak is still really quite young. I mean, it's like maybe 10 feet tall and about as wide as my arm span. You, know, you could certainly plant it, but I would say choke cherry is more of something that you just find a spot where there is a lot of it and wildcraft it because yeah. it's not that pretty of a tree. It is so prone to diseases that I think it might be frustrating to plant it in your yard as a part of your landscape. Well, I was thinking mm-hmm. I planted choke- it there for a few years and yeah. then just cut it down. Oh, but, you could try yeah. that. And black it's- cherry works pretty well too. So you yeah. could do that. And yeah. it, you know, it can be a small surface. tree, but then it eventually turns big. When it gets right. big, it's it's... It, it gets quite big, but you could cut yeah. it down before that point yeah. and then use it as medicine. You can also with barks. I have, I personally don't do this because I usually just work with the younger plant material and twigs and things, but you could go out after a storm and yeah. look for blowdowns and then make medicine off of those. Yeah. But if they're bigger, you usually do need to, and this is true for most barks, you yeah. will need to separate the outer bark and use just the, that inner bark, but not the woody pith. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So that kind of mi- yeah. middle of the, the bark. Yeah, I did that this May with cottonwood, actually, mm-hmm. just because I've never used cottonwood and I had the opportunity. And it was it was a like, what was that, like a six foot long branch that I found that had fallen and it was maybe as wide as my wrist. Yeah. So it was big enough. That I'm like, oh, I'll do this. It'll be fun. Yeah. So I sat and listened to the Herbal Entrepreneur Conference and listened to your interview on that, actually. Um, nice. <laughs> so, <laughs> oh, it all comes apart. around. Yeah. Yeah. Well, let's let we're we're just getting all excited about this conversation. Let's get into a couple of these other plants, uh, mullen in the plantain and marshmallow. Yeah. So, you know, some of these plants in this garden are weeds and some of them are, you know, more cultivated plants. And then some of them you could kind of mm-hmm. do a little bowl. So mullen is one that is technically a weed and you could just go out and wildcraft it. It's usually pretty right. common across most of the country. We had it out in the Southwest. We have it in New Hampshire. It likes disturbed sunny areas. Mm-hmm. And, uh, but I do let it volunteer throughout the garden. It really likes the garden paths for me because I don't have that much nice. really sunny dry spot, but it does like that. And so I let it volunteer there and I use the roots for medicine more for joints and connective tissue as taught by Jim McDonald. But then the leaves are primarily what I will use for the respiratory system. And they're just so amazing. So when we're talking about yeah. fires, that yeah. would be one of the key herbs, you know, that marshmallow and possibly some plantain and Korean licorice would be a good flavoring agent for that would be all herbs I would consider for when things are like 
dry, irritated, inflamed. So fires definitely will do that, but also some of our respiratory and allergy symptoms too. They just, mullein leaves are so soothing, healing, um, even in chronic respiratory situations, they'd be worth considering as a supportive. So things like COPD, Mm -hmm. emphysema, it's not going to cure them, but it might help kind of manage the symptoms and help people just feel a little bit better. And it may even help with repair Mm -hmm. as time goes on. Some people will smoke it because by inhaling the smoke of mullen, it does direct kind of soothing antispasmodic effects to the lungs. But I am personally not a huge fan of inhaling smoke, smoke and yeah, especially yeah, when you're dealing especially with smoke, smoke issues season. right so yeah. tea yeah. is a yeah. favorite way to use it and then tincture would be another way that i'll use it so i, I use it pr- quite a bit in both ways it tastes decent enough it's not amazing but you can cover it up one of the tricks to it it does have a lot of hairs on the leaves that can sometimes be irritating it sure does Some people in mm-hmm. particular are more sensitive to that so that is one that makes it a little challenging because i'll want to usually strain it through a coffee filter or a yeah. finely woven cloth whereas i usually use metal mesh yeah. strainers mm-hmm. for my stuff and the hairs do get through that white t-shirts Works white great because yeah, it's got the stretch, t-shirt. so you know how oh, yeah, milky yeah. that can be. So just squish it, and the you yeah. don't have the tears like you do with the coffee yeah. filters. Yeah. And sometimes I'll, you know, sometimes clients will just strain it through a coffee filter or something like that. But then you could also put it in, like, use that as a tea bag. I don't use that many tea bags, but that's one that I might throw into a tea bag and put it in with your other herbs in your blend and your French press. But mm-hmm. really nice soothing herb and very. You know, it's self-seeds. It's a biennial. So, you know, the first year you'll just have leaves. The second year it'll put up a flowering stalk mm-hmm. and you can harvest the tall, leaves. At, tall, yeah. tall flowering stalk listeners. Yeah. Yellow flowers. <laughs> Yellow flowers can be used too as medicine, but really they're so small. Like I don't even bother harvesting oh the flowers. Gosh. So yeah. I just stick with the leaves. But anytime the leaves look happy, which can be from like early spring into late fall, you can use them for medicine. Mm-hmm. Yeah. All right. Just make sure that it's not something else like foxglove because foxglove can look a little bit like right. mullen. And there have been a few people who have died thinking they were harvesting mullen and yeah. never actually harvesting foxglove. Plant foxglove ID. doesn't, yeah, but you have many yeah. ways to identify, but one thing, and you'll want more things besides one thing, but mullen is a little bit more soft and flannelly, mm-hmm. but mm-hmm. foxglove can still have a lot of hairs on it. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Don't harvest it unless you know for for full sure. sure. Yeah. yeah. And the flowering stock, if you want to wait till it flowers, that will be a dead giveaway. Yeah. Mullen is very distinctive in in bloom. Yeah. And yeah. Um, listeners, please remember that you don't have to harvest something in order to identify it. You can just take pictures of it. Take pictures of the leaf. Take pictures of the flower. Take pictures of the root. Take pictures of the whole thing and and in the environment that's in, and then. Get on some kind of group and ask people for help. But there is get your guide out. Yeah, get your guide out. Bring your field there. guides with you because it right. is easier to identify them when you're sitting yeah. next to the plant. Yeah, so you bring your bring field guides. guides. I love yep. new gums out in the Northeast. Do you guys have a favorite field guide for the Oregon area? Oh, there's so many. I have a lot. I, I was going to say, you, I'm sure you've got a favorite or yeah, three. And I'll put some <laughs> contacts on the, the um, show notes as well. Yeah, especially uh, since some of these are wild plants. Yeah. Exactly, yeah. yeah. But, well, and marshmallow, not as wild plantain, though, quite wild. Yes, yes, definitely. Although, I honestly, have seen marshmallow in the wild, like while portaging through meadows in, yeah. can- mm-hmm. in, in Canada with my kayak. But uh, but usually I just see marshmallow in, in the garden. But you can yeah. use a lot of other mallow family plants interchangeably. So some of those could be wild plants. But marshmallow, do we want to, should we yes. move on to marshmallow? Yes, so this please. is one that's actually kind of nice in the garden, kind of like whorehound. These are more cultivated plants. Marshmallow does like it kind of marshy. That's mm-hmm. where it gets its name. So and it's mellow. And it is kind of mellow it, it will get quite <laughs> tall mellow mellow it, i mean it gets taller than i am which isn't too hard because i'm only five feet tall but you can get you know six feet or more tall when it's yeah. in bloom it has these kind of pretty pale pink flowers it's a little prone to japanese beetles in our neck of the woods so mm-hmm. you might want to harvest it kind of earlier in its growth so that the japanese beetles haven't descended upon them yet but you know you could harvest them even if they have a little few little chew holes in them but uh, just really lovely as a tea ingredient. And I, I end up buying marshmallow root more often than I harvest and make my own because it's really not that expensive. And you can get it from places like Mountain Rose 
pretty easily. So I'll use those in teas, but I also love using the leaf in tea. Mm -hmm. And the leaf is very easy to harvest in abundance because it's such a big plant and yeah. you don't have to kill it to harvest leaves and flowers. If you have a few of those, they're kind of fun to throw in as well. And it's just this very nice, soothing, slimy, like really moistening. You know, marshmallow is yeah. a bit moistening, but uh, sorry, mullein is a bit moistening, but marshmallow is like you know, mucilaginous, mucousy moistening. Yeah, yes. So when people are dry, that's an excellent herb to consider. And then even just in respiratory tea blends, it's a great supportive herb because a lot of our more aromatic herbs are a little bit like hot and dry by nature, like bee balm and oregano and thyme. And sometimes that's just a little too much. And it's just a lot of flavor and throwing a little bit of marshmallow and just kind of softens the blend mm -hmm. energetically, but also softens it flavor wise. It's mm -hmm. just got this nice, pleasant, mm, sweet kind of like sweet, mm -hmm. you know, the roots are a little sweeter, um, yeah. but then the, the leaves are still kind of like sweet green flavor, just very mild. Yeah. And it's one of my favorite tea blending ingredients now is just for all sorts of tea blends as this kind of background flavor mm -hmm. to pull everything together and soften all the herbs. I found that the, the marshmallow leaves are so much easier to work with if you want to make a syrup out of them oh, because yeah. that mucilaginous yeah. stuff from the root doesn't blend as well when you're yeah. trying to make a syrup. Yeah, and the also mm -hmm. sometimes people have the the FODMAP issue, so and they yeah. they they react to a lot of the starchy complex starches in foods. So if you're you know having a lot of gas and pain and bloating from apples and chickpeas and gluten and dairy, you might not be digesting those complex starches. Occasionally, you'll see marshmallow root listed on the anti FODMAP sites, like don't eat this, you know, drink this tea. It's horrible. Usually, it's fine, actually. Mm -hmm. But um, if you were concerned, making tea out of the cut and sifted root is going to be a little less problematic. And then making a tea out of the leaves is really unlikely to be a yeah. problem at all. Mm -hmm. So that's another use for the leaves is to, when you want to soothe and heal the gut and or the respiratory system, but you don't want it to be quite so starchy, but yet it still has this nice velvety mouthfeel when you drink the tea, nice. you know, as opposed to feeling like you're drinking mucus, which is right. what it would feel like if you use right. marshmallow root powder in yes. water. It's oh, like yeah. you yeah. are drinking yeah. mucus, which has its benefits, but can yeah. be a little off-putting. Yes. Yeah. That's not what you want your mouth. Uh, mm -mm. Yeah, no, just, that's no. what you're trying to get out of your yeah, mouth. Trying to yeah. get that out. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. So you know, marshmallow and plantain, which is one of the other herbs in this garden, are both probably more famous for gut healing because they're just so mm -hmm. soothing and healing, and a little bit mucilaginous. Plantain is much less mucilaginous, but it still has that kind of demulcent, soothing, moistening property, and uh, they can be used for the gut. They're favorites in my gut healing tea blends for my clients, but then at the same time. They're also very useful for soothing and healing and moistening the lungs. And plantain has some antibacterial properties. And some of the research, it does suggest that it's a little bit biofilm busting. So mm. even though we don't think of it as this knockout antimicrobial herb, it's worth considering in formulas for infections. And then it does have some tightening, toning, gently astringent properties as well, which can be useful for the gut. Mm -hmm. too. Wow. So. That's really good to know. So your favorite herbs to throw in with that marshmallow for flavor, would you? Would that be a more of a peppermint or? Well, they it all depends. The Korean mint. Yeah. The Korean mint. Yeah, what yeah. a Korean yeah. mint. Come Heck on. Yeah. Korean <laughs> Come on, Sue. That's definitely a favorite. <laughs> and the wild cherry. That'd be yeah. a good one in there too. Wild cherry tastes pretty good with it. And, and wild cherry, even though it's a bark, it is better as an infusion. If you were going to make a tea with it, I use it more often as a tincture, but if you were going to make a tea with it, it is more effective as a you know, as an infusion versus a decoction because you retain more of the healing properties and even like mm -hmm. slightly tepid water, you know, not quite boiling, sort of what yeah. you would use to make green tea as opposed to black tea. Oh. So that will do an even better job still extracting, but not destroying some of those properties. And if you let it steep a little longer, that's fine. And, you know, all these make good teas except the whorehound because it's just so bitter i mean it's still mm -hmm. medicinal as a tea but it's you will be gagging by okay, how bitter it is you have to back up for a second you said something about the temperature difference between green tea and black tea mm -hmm. yeah say that say the words oh, yeah. again so yeah. i don't if i was a tea <laughs> sommelier i would know exactly the temperature but uh the temperature you know to the degree but 
with green tea, it's going to make a better tasting tea if you Mm -hmm. brew it with not quite boiling or when the bubbles are little as it starts to boil. Whereas with black tea, it's usually made with like hot, hot water if you're a tea purist. Ah, And it just makes a better flavor profile. If you want really well-made green tea, you're going to set your kettle to somewhere around 185 degrees Fahrenheit. And I don't have the calculate or the centigrade memorized, Mm -hmm. so I don't know what that is, but and if you want good black tea, it's going to be closer to coffee temperature, which is 202. I like mine more like 199, mm-hmm. but, you know, 202 does well. Mm-hmm. And then when you do your second steeping on both of those, you can raise it about five or six degrees and it will pull out more without getting an excess of bitter. Oh. So if you do two steepings, that way you get more flavor, less bitter. If you're doing white tea, you're going to want to be closer to like the low 180s, maybe the high 170s. And it's yeah. okay if you don't have, I don't have yeah. a temperature gauge on my tea yeah. kettle, but you still yeah. <laughs> can make good tea. But definitely, yeah. you know, some things do brew with a slightly less hot. And you'll hear with marshmallow too, sometimes you're like, don't ever use hot water. Make sure that it's cold. Marshmallow makes an excellent cold infusion because you, mm-hmm. especially if you let it steep for several hours or overnight, you'll get more of those mucilaginous properties. Mm-hmm. But it's totally fine to use hot water with it. You'll just yeah. get some of the other properties of the plant at the same time, which is not a problem. So mm-hmm. I, I have done with marshmallow root side by side where I started with hot water with one and cold water with the other and let them steep overnight. And really there was not a discernible difference between the two and the amount of mucilage. So it's not that the hot water destroys it. You will find that if you reheat that, that the mucilage does kind of, it's almost like when you make bone broth and it's cold and it's all gelatinous, uh, but then when you mm-hmm. heat it, it's back to liquid again. And some people consider that a problem, but I really don't because your body is a warm temperature anyway. Right. Yeah. And yet should things be. still work. So yes. yeah. I don't get really all up in arms with the exact temperature for marshmallow, hmm. but it does, you'll get more of the mucilage the longer it steeps. Okay. Yeah. That would probably be a good one to put in with your wild cherry and then let it steep overnight. Yes. After, you know, start with or hot. even just a couple of hours. Yeah. The marshmallow leaves, because leaves just give themselves so much more readily to water than yeah. roots do, you don't necessarily need to let it steep overnight, even just an hour or so. It would be fine yeah. and that would work. But if it yeah. steeps longer, that's not a problem. Yeah. Mm-hmm. But it doesn't need to to fully extract the properties. Right. Wow. This is this is fabulous. Yeah. So I now think we're gonna all excited. We're gonna go start planting, right? Yeah. Yeah. Yep. We're gonna up. start planting, and I think this is one of those podcasts because it's so full of information that people are people are gonna rewind, listen to it again, and keep in mind all of this information mm-hmm. and more is in Maria Noel Grove's book, Grow Your Own Herbal Remedies, mm-hmm. and that is printed by Story. I it's, believe it's it is. story publishing and Stacy Cramp was our photographer. She did a great job. Mm-hmm. And just to put a little plug in, you know, you can get this book anywhere books are sold and you know, I'm sure but you'll you be able to get it through your site. Get it but if you get it through <laughs> me, unfortunately there are no discounts because I just can't compete with the big places. Mm-hmm. But to offset that, I have nice bonus materials. So there are a whole bunch of extra plant profiles and charts and recipes and a whole mushroom chapter and call it the last chapter. We had to cut it for space, but there's a whole chapter on <sighs> mushroom wildcrafting and cultivation and making medicines with those and uh, and then there are some remedy making videos so there is one on making some respiratory blends some gut blends some brain boosting bonbons and just how to make basic remedies as well as specific recipes that are in the book because each each garden has a few really simple recipes that you can make from it which we'll be talking about in another podcast but yeah. You know, you that's what's kind of with the book, but we have extra stuff in the yes. bonus items and some videos so to go with folks, it. If you get signed copies through me at wintergreenbotanicals.com. Yes. It, is, it is so worth it. So definitely go to wintergreenbotanicals.com to buy this book. For if you want yeah. the bonus bits and you mm-hmm. want to more specifically support Maria Noel Groves in her endeavors to keep us on the right herbal path. And it's mm-hmm. kind of like collecting herbal Pokemon. So think of it that way, too. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, thank you so much for being with us again and sharing all of your amazing wisdom. Always thank a joy you. to Aww. see both of you. Well, actually, all three of you. Thanks. Yes. <laughs> so where do people get a hold of you? What's your website? Uh, wintergreenbotanicals.com. I have all sorts of free info on there. And you can find out about me and sign up for my mailing list. And then I am also on Facebook as Wintergreen Botanicals. And I'm on Instagram as Maria Noel Groves. And I'm pretty active on both of those. They do also go to Twitter, but I'm 
more active on Facebook and Instagram. Okay. All right. Well, thanks again very yeah, much. Thank you. Uh, what? <laughs> what? <laughs> Don't, pointing at me. What? Well, because you, you like to remind our listeners about contacting us, don't you? Oh, do I? Well, yeah. Uh, you love it. The I smile like on it. your face yes. tells it well, all. Remember, we're on Facebook. We're on Instagram. And uh, there you go. I'm not going to plug it down. But I will say, if you want to do a review, that always helps us. So go to iTunes.com for a review mm-hmm. um, or Stitcher or Lipson or anywhere else you you listen to podcasts and give us a review. Yeah. So with that, put, put an herb on it. it. Today's show is brought to you by Get Healthy Now with Candice. Get healthy now, not later, not before, already now, and not tomorrow, now, right? (laughs) Okay, right now. (laughs) If you'd love to do a consult and look at ways that you can get more healthy in your life, that you can improve your current feelings of wellness and and lifestyle, give me a shout. You can look look me up at gethealthynow.com. Or get healthy now with Candice.com. Mm-hmm. Okay. Oh. And Occupy Medical. Occupy Medical is is changing. We have... What? Yes, I know. It's really mm-hmm. weird. But we, I've always, in the past, said we're a street reach. And we're still doing street reach. We're doing it a different way. We have a place in Springfield. And we also have a clinic that we have opened and have been doing for the last couple of months in Eugene. And that's the street reach part where we're, we're specifically working with people that are unhoused. The clinic that we have in Springfield is a building and we have two Mm -hmm. suites of it. And one part is for hygiene supplies and food for people that are are struggling. They can just come in and get whatever they need. Mm -hmm. And then we have the other part, which is the medical part with the herbal um, part of it and then the counseling as well as the integrated health part. And that is just because we have a place just like anybody that's coming out of being unhoused to being housed. They find all of a sudden all of these survival skills that they needed to have time for. They don't need to have time for it anymore because, you know, they got four walls around us and that's the same thing for us. So yeah, it's been it's great to be nice. able to burst out and do a whole bunch more projects. So so how can people contribute? Well, we are a 501c3 and that is, um, there's a bunch of uh, information that we have on Facebook and Twitter and on our website at occupy-medical.org. All right. And we're now, uh, our next sponsor is Mud Paw Design House. It's, uh, formerly Hunter Creation. This is the first time we're talking about it uh, mm-hmm. over the air, if you will. So Mud Paw Design House is a company that Candace and I run and own, and it is graphic design and website design. If you're looking for a website that will match your your branding of your, of your, your printed materials, we can help you out. Or... If you have uh, printing materials and need a website, we can help you out with that too. So let us know at mudpawdesignhouse.com. That's a mud paw, M- mud, like a dog paw mud that's muddy. Mudpawdesign.com yeah. or mudpawdesignhouse.com. That's cute. Right. <laughs> All right. And how about you, Sue? What about me? What do you What do you, What do you bring to the table? What do I bring to the table? Well, I've got two. Th- should I just talk about the two things real quick? What, uh, yeah, sure. I'll talk about Patreon first. Um, so I mentioned before about Occupy Medical, and I do a lot of stuff just during the week working with people that I cannot build them. I just can't. Yeah, they don't yeah. have any money. <laughs> right. But being yeah. a community herbalist, the work, uh, I've been doing this for so long, the work just has to be done. So yeah. I am asking for people to donate to my Patreon account so that I can continue working with people. And with that kind of sponsorship, that means that um, I could also continue training other folks that want to open up clinics like we have. And I've been doing that and I've just been kind of doing it for free. So we need community herbalism in this country and I am willing to be um, the voice of experience. So I just need support from people. And you can go to my Patreon account at www.patreon.com slash Sue Sierra Lupe. Okay. That's really cool. Yep. That's just one of them. Do you have any? Oh, do you have any more? Do you have any supporters yeah. already? So I do. I have a couple of wonderful supporters that have been brave enough to put in for um, one of them as a one-time supporter, and then uh, um, the others are monthly supporters. Nice, nice. Yep. So, All right. Did thank you have something you very else? Much. Yes. Yeah, so there's also uh, Sierra Lupe Herbal Consulting, and that's at uh, gmail.com. and that is my business that I do herbal consulting, and that is for People get charged per hour for that one. So mm-hmm. 
that's that they get the same kind of service um and I can come to people's houses and do things online and uh that's available so you've heard the genius <laughs> now you can have that in your life too <laughs> all right ace high heat graphics custom printed shirts and caps and everything else that you can wear um they're specially they're specializing in um event wear so if you are a an herbal organization and you are putting on a fair or a festival and you need to have two, three hundred shirts done, that Ace High Heat Graphics can help you out and save you a lot of money. Yeah. So, you know, the other thing that Ace High Heat Graphics is doing is also doing branded wear for companies. So for within the company. So if you are a herbal organization and you have employees and people and volunteers that you want to get, have them all wearing like the same shirts or they would like to support the company by purchasing a shirt. That's another thing that Ace right. Heat Graphics yeah, we're, does. We're, in mm -hmm. fact, we, we're doing a, a, a company store for a large client right now. So their nice. employees can go there and buy um, their shirts. Um, we did a promotion for that company and all the employees liked the shirts so much that they, they wanted to buy them for workwear. Nice. Mm -hmm. So they said, can you help us with that? So we're setting them up with a with an online store. That's fairly cool. And yeah. with the political season brewing up, I'm sure there's a lot of people that would want their slogans written on their shirts too. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. All right. And finally, the herbal nurse. The statements made about herbs and products on this podcast have not been evaluated by the United States Food and Drug Administration, FDA, and are not intended to diagnose, treat, cure, or prevent disease. All information provided on this podcast or any affiliated websites is for informational purposes only and is not intended as a substitute for advice from your physician or other healthcare professional. You should not use the information on this podcast and its affiliated websites for a diagnosis or treatment of any health problem. Always consult with healthcare professional before starting any new vitamins, supplements, diet, or exercise program before taking any medication or if you have or suspect you might have a health problem. Any testimonials, questions, or case studies